All right, you should be able to find me, Matey O. There you are. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? Good, and you? Yeah, good, thanks, mate. Um, so, oh, world's falling down. So I think we're going to, I, I definitely posted this as being episode one, but this is the third time that we've, we've gotten together at this point. Um, I said episode one, why? Because last time we kind of chatted for like an hour and a half and it was, it was just yeah. over the top. Um, <laughs> Got a little out of a... Uh... Out of sync. Yeah, so we've uh, we've drilled it down today just to talk about one topic, and we're both going to try and do just fifteen minutes each. Um, and and we're going to start by talking about aging. And uh, we did quickly connect now. And uh, the beautiful thing for us, I think, with aging is that when we talk about animals or we talk about dry aging and wet aging meat, as beautifully described by Lyle, we're talking about the decomposition of yeah meat controlled decomposition which is beautiful and when we're talking about aging whiskey obviously it's a legal requirement but we're also really just talking about changing some liquid into like potentially let's pick 12 year 12 year old brown water that's yeah. alcoholic sounds delicious <laughs> <laughs> um so i'm, I'm going to jump in and uh, cover a little bit about why we age scotch and then lyle's going to uh Jump in as well. If anyone has any questions, throw them in. Lyle will be able to read them whilst I'm speaking. And yeah, uh, and I'll be saying hi to some people when they join as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so why do we age scotch? Um, we age scotch. We age whiskey because we legally have to. This is uh, new make spirit coming from Highland Park. This is this is what it looks like when it comes up the still, right? Um, mm -hmm. It is crystal clear, and it is legally not called a scotch until it's been in a barrel for three years of age. So. Okay. We age it because we legally have to. And that's obviously right. come about for like years and years and years of practice and experience. I mean, the vast majority of whiskey throughout history up until like the last 150 years was drunk unaged. Right. Not always. So is that, is that essentially ethanol? Right. Uh, so it's, 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 it's more than just that. So yeah, but there is ethanol in here, um, like that, that primary alcohol, but there's lots of different chemical compounds in here, especially flavors. Yeah. Like this already, I'm a big fan. I, I really like that. <laughs> Lots of mixed spirit. It's delicious. Um, right. Like, I think it's a great replacement for something like this. Almost like a mezcal cachaça pisco. Almost like a yeah. rough mezcal other brandy, I guess. Um, great brandy. It's beautiful. It's fruity. It's already got a lot of flavor. Like we talked about last time, distillation and then, you know, going through a fermentation. It It has a lot of flavor at this point. But it can also have notes that we just don't want. And we've learned over time that we don't want them by trial and error. But, um, you know, our, our history and our modern knowledge of this is recent. We've been making this and aging things in, in barrels for much longer than we've had good scientific information on it. Um, right. So really, you know, we've, we've been aging in barrels. So, I mean, you can see the head behind me, just sticks of wood, basically. And these are oak casks, which we've been using pretty much since the Roman period, like 2000 mm -hmm. years. And the design's pretty much unchanged. Before this, it used to be like clay amphora. So, you know, those big clay vessels. Yeah, they're big, they're heavy, they fall off the back of the wagon. Some, yeah, yeah, like a pain <laughs> in the butt, right? And um, they so they do offer some interaction, but obviously it's not like you're getting a lot of flavor from clay. But it can be reused, and re it's like a neutral vessel, right? It's like stainless steel. We didn't have stainless steel at the time. Yeah, that so we use wood. Um, now it's too, it's 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 always oak, to my knowledge, um, and we make them into a different numbers of sizes. So the barrel is super important when it comes to maturing our whiskey, right? Uh, typical sizes, you've got a hogshead, which is like this 250 liter barrel, which is just a bit bigger than American bourbon casks around about 200 liters. All the way up to these punchins of like 550 liters. The bigger the barrel, the more surface area, the less, um, but the less surface area to liquid ratio added. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. the, the, bigger, the bigger the barrel, the bigger the liquid inside, but you, you then have just like less surface area for the amount of liquid that there is. The smaller a barrel goes. It's like when you're aging a cocktail at home in those teeny liter casks. It's like, oh, yeah. it's going to age so quickly. And it's because obviously it's just, it's so much smaller. It's going to be able to, you know, you're going to have a better surface area ratio there. Uh, after that, really what type of oak it is makes a big difference. Uh, so I've got two with me here. I've got Quercus Alba. This is American oak. 
um, if you remember, this is one that I said was like really tightly grained like this. Mm -hmm. And then you've got Quercus rover. This is European oak. There's more than one species of oak in both places, but European oak typically less dense, more kind of porous, more like a sponge. So whatever we put into it previously, whether we did or not put anything into it previously makes a big difference as well. Um, so we've got the size, we've got the type of barrel that it is, like the physically what actual wood it is, and it's going to change the different flavor compounds that are in there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. definitely. All right. So um, with what? these, what goes into it previously makes a big difference. So I said, like, this is an American ex bourbon cask, right? So you, yeah. can see the, you can see the color of this. This is 17 years old. This is a 17 year old, still American oak. You see how it's a bit darker here? Yeah, 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 American sure. Oak, but this is a sherry cask, okay? okay? So you can see the, the difference here is because when you put sherry into something, sherry's like 16%, it's not stripping as much color and flavor from the barrel. Making a bourbon, an ex-bourbon cask, you put that bourbon in there, it's a high proof spirit, it is stripping flavor and color aggressively. Mm -hmm. So by the time that we come to use it, you've already lost a lot of it. And then you take things like rum, if you're using an ex-rum barrel, which you might do, well, that probably used to be an ex-bourbon barrel. The right, so this is like the third, like... So yeah. now we've stepped into something else, right? Now we're talking about how many times have you used the barrel? Like, is it a first fill barrel? Is it a refill cask? Again, here, this one... Uh, oh, no, that's my bourbon. This one here is an American <laughs> oak uh, sherry cask that's a refill. But even being a refill cask, it's still darker than this American oak first fill ex-bourbon cask when it came to aging it in scotch, right? Yeah, right. And then when you start to talk about European oak, you can see the color difference here, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. And so that yeah. one on, yeah, that one you're spinning there is dark, a lot darker. A lot darker, right? Again, it's all down to the fact that these are both ex sherry casks, pretty much made the exact same way. It's just that the ex European, though it's yeah, like, more it's way, way more porous, you get a lot more color and flavor back. Um, after you've kind of like gone through your barrel size and where it's from, the species of oak, oh dear, what's happening in your ends? Oh, that's, that's my music to my ears. That's always going, always. Well, I say it's not music to my ears, but it's, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> very busy. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's a very dark, dark departure there. Yeah. <laughs> um, after, after you've gone through that, then um, really how and where the, the whiskey is stored then makes a big difference as well. Like, in, if you're aging in Scotland, like at Highland Park off the north coast, it's pretty chilly around, maritime climate, high humidity, low temperature, not big flavor, uh, not big temperature swings either throughout the day or yeah. through the year. Like in the middle of winter, it can be nine degrees. In the middle of summer, it can be nine degrees. You're not just, you know, the, the more that you have this fluctuation from day to day or year to year, the more mm. kind of like seeping in and out of the barrel happens. But we also have this element of um, how, what are we going to lose? Right? Yeah. The colder it is, the less we lose. The hotter it is, the more we lose. But then depending on the humidity, depends on what we're going to lose. If it gets really hot and it gets really humid, we're going to you lose a lot. Yeah, well, that's it. We're going to lose, all, we're going to lose a, a lot of alcohol in this point. So if you go to somewhere like, um, let's think about this. If you go to somewhere like Kentucky, um, where you've got a good temperature, but then you've got this lower humidity, we can end up losing water, right? Lower humidity in the air. So the water from the yeah. ground escapes, so that alcohol can actually go up. Okay, and is that a good thing, or is that a bad thing? It's a thing. It, it's, <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's a thing, you know. Um, you, when, when we were distilling, we were concentrating alcohol. Now we're concentrating alcohol again, but this time without distilling, just through the aging process. But if you go to Scotland, um, and I, well, I should say another thing, I suppose, having higher alcohol it's good for the producer because at the end, they're probably going to cut it back down with water to bring it to a lower strength. Well, right. the higher the alcohol is, the more you can cut it back cut with it the water. Down. But the right. more you cut it back with water, you're always going to impact the amount of flavor that you get, right? Yeah, because you're diluting it, essentially. Right. Concentration it is exactly that. In Scotland, it's the opposite. Like, you remember we talked about that barrel that we tasted that was like 40 odd years old. It's yeah. been losing all of this water throughout, but it's been losing more alcohol. So that barrel, when it was filled, was 69%. When we tasted it, it was 41% because it's been losing all of this alcohol the whole time. And then we right. had to bottle it because we had to bottle it. So otherwise it's no longer scotch, right? And yeah, so yeah, that's yeah. how that works. And then if you go to the Caribbean, um, you can find high temperature and high humidity or this perfect balance of humidity rather, where you actually end up losing, like you might be losing, I don't know, 12 to 15% a year of the liquid, but you lose alcohol and water at the same at rate. At the same rate. 
So you can right. fill it at like 60 and it could be 60 at the end, which is remarkable. Mm. Um, so that in a nutshell is aging in whiskey. Why do we age? Because it makes it look and smell and taste great. Um, <laughs> it can soften off a lot of the kind of like unfavorable elements of like new make spirit, um, as well as then obviously saturate. I mean, color is utterly meaningless. Again, I mentioned last time, uh, it's meaningless in the sense that a lot of people just add coloring anyway. But it, yeah. it, it doesn't say everything really for me when I'm having a whiskey. It's all about the flavor. That's really what I'm in about. The, the colors that signifier, which if I know the brand doesn't add coloring, fine, that's great. It means I can tell a lot about it. But um, but really, it's all about changing that flavor, the, the reaction or the, the interaction between cask and spirit, yeah. gaining flavor, gaining color, and really taking us on this journey. And these barrels, again, like account for about 70 to 80% of the final flavor, which is why we mature in that way. Um, and that, that's, that's aging whiskey in a nutshell. Wow, very much a nutshell. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Going, going, going back to the color of it, just quickly. Right. Do you find a lot of people perceive a lot from a color of a whiskey, thinking yeah. that the, the darker there is, the more flavor it's going to have, yeah. and all this kind of thing? And is that is that a, a true representation of what whiskey is, or not? So there's there's it, it like touches upon this bigger thing, which let's just say let's say like. I don't want to say perception and reality, but so uh, what's a good word? Like the intrinsic characters of a whiskey are, how does it look? How does it smell? How does it feel on the palate, taste on the palate, texture on the palate, the pungency on the nose, if it has spice, if it's aggressive, blah, blah, blah. Like, like just physical attributes of the whiskey. Yeah. Then we've got all of the, you know, all of our understanding of whiskey, of marketing, of branding, whether you like consider yourself passionate about it or like a connoisseur of it or whatever it is. And like, we just can't, we can't remove that information from us. So like, when I look at this, it's, a, well, it's a, be a beautiful dark amber color, but even the fact that I said beautiful in there, right? I'm already pulling like, is it beautiful? It's a dark amber color, that's what it is. I now yeah. see it beautiful because of this wider world that I just can't escape. Like, we're, you must have the same thing in meat, you know, where, where you just, everyone already has their perceptions about this. You can't escape them or they can't escape them. We can't escape our own ideas of the things. No. Uh, so again, like, is it, yeah, it's a, it's a tough question. Is it, is it meaningful? Yeah. If it matters to you, is it meaningful? Yeah. It doesn't matter to you? No. But the general consensus is, which maybe answers the question is, I'm not saying it's true, but the general consensus seems to be the older it is, the darker it is, the better it is. That's a generally held thing, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're going to pay more money for an older scotch than a younger one, and it and that price goes up exponentially. That doesn't relate to like, if you take a 12 year old, divide it, and then take an 18 year old and divide it by 18, and you look at the two numbers, it's not like you're just paying an equal amount for the rent, you know? No. And then maybe a bit the angel share. Um, so even just where it hits on the shelf and things like that, yeah, we just can't escape these kind of like biases that we have. So does it matter? Yes. Does it matter? No. Does no. It matter you? That's probably what really matters, right? I mean, you're the yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. If you if you enjoy it, then just enjoy it. Like, right. Drink what you enjoy. It's like right. a, well, that's and a how you want to enjoy it. Yeah. Huh? And how you want to enjoy it, right? You know, exactly. I was just about to say that. That's a different kettle of fish, like getting into, do you put ice in your whiskey? Do you not put ice in your whiskey? Definitely another episode. Oh. After that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, cool. Um, so shall I crack on with yeah, jump aging on of meat? Perfect. Yeah. Um, so it's, as you said before, uh, we we're talking about pretty, it sounds very disgusting, but it's a con controlled decomposition of a meat product, right? Which is what mm -hmm. aging is. So it sounds so nice, sound so, so delicious. But uh, there's reasons for why we do it. Obviously, it's under very controlled uh, uh, circumstances, refrigerated obviously but there's two different well, two why, main why do we refrigerate it like we don't refrigerate barrels right we just leave it to white like it seems obvious but and i presume it's to do with bacteria and things but exactly bacteria okay. breaking down and it just slows the whole process down because you could you've left well, you probably haven't but you've seen stuff on the side of the road and gone one day oh that's just been killed or something and then you come back right. a week later and it's completely decomposed well not completely decomposed that's but yeah, it started to go smelly, oh, okay. so the, rotten. The temperature is really just a control mechanism. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Got it. Um, two main methods, 
I'm going to touch on both today. And there's a few new ones that are out there that I'm going to skip over very briefly because I don't know too much about them. I've never done... Well, I've done one of them once, but anyway, we'll get to that later. Uh, wet aging and dry aging. You would have heard of both of them, I imagine, or ex definitely experienced both of them. Dry aging I've heard of. I've never really heard someone speak about wet aging other than knowing that you talk about it. Right, okay. So, I mean, like, wet aging... Um, is far more commonly used than dry aging. So any meat that you've had from like a supermarket or um, a produce store that hasn't got dry aging labeled on it will definitely have been wet aged. Mm. Okay. So that goes like goes for stuff like poultry, um, pork, lamb, beef, poultry, you don't really need to do it, but it's just, it's another way of um, like packing stuff. It makes it cleaner. Um, if you so, so is it like with with wet aging then like you said like all these different animals do you have to age everything do you not have to age everything um you don't have is to age everything at all benefit? like uh yeah there's definitely benefits of aging things uh chicken you don't really need to wet age that's good to go after two days like that's fine to eat straight away essentially but it needs to be aged for two days minimum essentially uh pork beef pork and lamb uh is about a week like seven day seven days to ten days that's a, that's like perfect sort of time to eat it but you can eat it sooner uh and then beef there is arguments that it actually tastes pretty bad straight away and it has to be aged for at least 28 days but if you eat it straight away beef it'll be terrible be really mushy and yeah not nice at all um, I'm really curious now, though. I mean, again... Well, you want to try it? <laughs> well, just to know what the difference is, right? I mean... Yeah, well, this is, this is why this works brilliantly, but then it also doesn't work great because I can't share this with you. I can't cook you a, uh, a, a five-day-aged steak on the barbecue, wet-aged, and then a 60-day-drove. But, but, but you can you can do it live sometime, and you can, like, you've, got a good, you've got a good palate. You can let us know how it goes. Yeah, I can let you know, definitely. Yeah, yeah you I can do it. Definitely tell, I can definitely tell you what one tastes better. You, you um, do that disgusting thing that you don't want to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. God damn my job. <laughs> um, right, so back to wet-aging, sorry. Wet-aging is essentially, if you don't know what it is, you get a big plastic bag, um, it's very, it's a, sorry, let's go back. It's a very new way of aging meat because uh, signs behind uh, plastic bags and things like that have come a long, long way, obviously. Uh, so you get a big plastic bag, put your meat inside it, go over to the machine, which is a vacuum packer. So it literally uh, pulls all the air hmm. out of uh, the bag. So you get a really tight seal on it. So you're taking that oxygen away. Uh, from the um, meat product, which so slows down. Pretty much the same thing that, because, you know, so many people now do have like at home sous vide kits where they have their bag, they exactly. have a vacuum sealer. It's, they're basically doing that. That's, that's exactly what a vacuum packer does. That's what wet aging is. When does that happen? Like this is, this is after you've cut it, right? This is after, after cutting. Yeah. After yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. So this okay. is, so you can take smaller individual seamed out cuts and put it into that. Well, that's where wet aging is quite good in a way well we'll get to that in a minute because okay. there's less product loss sure. um so it's faster you can age a lot quicker in vacuum bags uh it's cleaner a lot cleaner there's no water going everywhere or uh the misconception of blood going everywhere because i say misconception of blood is because that liquid that you see inside the backpack bag that's not actually blood that's uh water and my and my uh myoglobin which is like if you remember back to last week's I've episode been cutting, when i've been cutting out the corner of like a pack and i've been dripping stuff out that that red stuff is not blood no so that's water and myoglobin so which if you go back to the last podcast that we did i talked about the decomposition of lactic acid on hemoglobin that's the byproduct of that decomposition ah that answers my Isn't second it? question so, well so then it kind of is blood but it's kind of like broken down blood exactly yeah so most of the blood gets gets cut out when it gets slaughtered. You drain it out. Otherwise, you get tainted meat. So when, when, the, when I, is, is there still <laughs> blood in the meat? Very, very small amount. Very, very small amount. So when somebody's like, I want it rare and bloody, you know, it's yeah. like, well, it's not really. No, like, it's not uh, really bloody. Huh. 
I mean, I guess it's kind of like, you know, it kind of is, but it's like decomposed, broken down blood. Yeah. Sounds huh. even more delicious, doesn't it? Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, with that, it sitting in that meat, in that juices, uh, has a negative effect on taste. You get, uh, I don't know if you've tasted, you would have tasted it. It's like quite metallic-y. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, quite metallic-y. Um, mineral taste, ceremony, you know, like it, it's it gets that. Sort of wet aging, right? That's the wet aging. That's what you can feel in your mouth uh-huh. like that. Um, yeah. So that's not, well, for me, it's not a desirable taste that I want when right. I come to eat meat. Um, also, you might notice some of the meats in those packs are a little bit paler, you know, like they, when you take it out, it's quite pale and it it's doesn't look very, it looks a bit grayish. In a, right, in a they're grey, but I don't want to confuse that with like, because things do turn grey when they're old as well, right? Yes, exactly. But if you take it out, it's within your use by date kind of thing. It will brighten up again. Give it an hour or two. Uh, it will brighten up when the oxygen hits it again. I'm, I'm not is... recommending you're thinking of doing this, but if I go back to like the clearance section of the, <laughs> of the meat area, and it's still yeah. really dead, if yeah. I'm, I'm not saying I'm going to do this, but if I'm going around there, you know, diving for a bargain, there's a chance that if it's like it's in date, the pack's clearly not ruptured or anything and it looks grey. It might just be that yeah. if I put it open, it might, I'm, again, I'm not suggesting I'm waiting for someone but, to yeah. think, oh, <laughs> 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 You fucking gave me food poisoning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, essentially not. If the packaging isn't broken or anything, then yeah. it should be fine. Huh. But yeah, so when the oxygen hits it again, that's oxyhemoglobin, uh, which okay. is, yeah. So that's re- it will re-brighten up. It will come back to life. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So downsides of wet aging, you get that nasty taste. Um, that, yeah. And it's just, for me, it's all about the taste with aging meat. Well, and eating meat. Okay. So, so, so go to the flip side then, if you're talking about like dry aging, and I'm probably skipping ahead then. Like you yeah. only said... Like, obviously, it can't be all that bad because it's massively done, right? Yeah. But then what are, so then what are we missing from the dry aging if that's so much superior? Like, what am I missing flavor-wise from dry aged meat? What, in the wet aging? Yeah. Uh, you're missing the, the interaction with the air that you're mm-hmm. getting with dry aging. You're, miss, you're missing... Um, it's like pretty much like what you're saying about the whiskey. The, the atmosphere around will have a attributed effect on that taste and, and meat flavor. Um, also with dry aging, it's exposed to the elements. So you get a lot more evaporation from the, from the meat. Hey, so, angel share. Meat angel share. Exactly, yeah, meat angel share. Let's do that. <laughs> Let's make that a thing. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, when you dilute, I don't know, like a cordial or something, sure. your flavor starts to lose. But if we could, no, what's a better example of this? When you're making your simple syrup, right? Right. You've got a load of sugar, a load of water, and you evaporate yes. it off. The flavor intensifies. It gets become oh, sugary me. and sugary. I, me, I just put mine, I just put mine in, the, in the bottle and just shake it. I don't do anything. <laughs> oh, really? Simple. I think we, because we talked about this before, for anyone that, that, that's into wine, I know it happens. It kind of like, is, so what you're saying is you've got, you've got the meat, you're losing all of this water loss, and you're concentrating on the flavors. It's almost yeah. like after they used to make, um, over here in the States, before they were distilling, we used to make cider, or we used to like make Applejack in a way where we would basically freeze the top layer of water, scrape it off, and then you're concentrating the flavors inside, left behind, right? The alcohol and the flavors. Exactly, yeah. So anyway, quickly back to wet aging. Pros, pros is not really pros for the consumer, but it's pros for the producers. Like you're losing a lot less. So there's a lot less angel, meat angel share, let's say, right. because you're not losing the liquid and you're not, you, don't, you also don't have to trim anything off of it which will come when I get to dry aging. Got it. Okay. okay. So wet aging, that's pretty much what I've seen everywhere. Unless it says dry aging, it sounds like it's, you're not saying it's a inferior product, but it kind of sounds like it might be slightly inferior depending on what you're into, but you're yeah. probably getting more bang for your buck because the producer is losing less as well. But yeah. they're selling me water as opposed to- Essentially, yeah, essentially. But it's not always good for the producer because the infrastructure of setting up a wet aging production line would be a fortune like a the normal vat packer that we use at work which is um ent- well not it's not entry level but it's still like three three and a half grand just for a little vat packer which oh. is 
Yeah, yeah like not how much people are spending on their at home sous vide setups. Exactly. So yeah. So One quick question for you. I don't know if you know an answer to this or not. I mean, I'm sure the answer is yes, but I don't know what the impact will be. Saying, can you wet age meat in whiskey? That's from Petra. Um, uh, like if you introduce alcohol into the mix. Okay, so that is being done. I was going to come on to that later. Um, okay. All there's right. a place. Well, then we'll get there's a, no, let's, we can do it now. We can do it really quickly now. All right. All right. Uh, there's a place in New York. This is where it kind of all started. Um, called the Beatrice Inn. Do you know, okay. have you heard of that? Uh, it's I Aggie. Myself. Yeah, it's Aggie Ma. She, she essentially has done, been the new person to create this kind of technique. It's essentially your, she does it with Jack Daniels, which is a bourbon, obviously. But well, it's a Tennessee whiskey you, you, I mean, you know, don't, don't, don't give Sorry. Us that. Oh, God, I'm going to start a fight here, aren't I? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you soak, like, cheesecloths, like a Hessian cheesecloths in whiskey and then wrap the meat in those uh, so you're not like so, putting like direct contact like no you're not submerging it in whiskey like a, submerging okay yeah so you just wrap the cloths wrap the meat in those cloths um and then is it dry aging yeah in yeah, yeah exactly in the cloths yeah yeah you okay. dry age it in the cloths and from my understanding of it like i said i don't really know much about it but my understanding is that you just soak it once and let that natural process happen so i don't know you know more about this than me but within zero to four degrees temperature does a lot of alcohol evaporation happen i don't know no typically not i mean it's always volatile but it, but the lower the temperature the lower the volatility you just you know it'll stay there if it was a higher temperature it would be like escaping off yeah exactly that's why i imagine but i don't know it might be worth it i've never tried it but i'd much rather Wait, we, should, we should try it we'll set that up at some point yeah i we would i'd probably rather drink the whiskey myself <laughs> but yeah i don't know we'll see okay. We'll, we'll yeah. do it. We'll, you know, cheesecloth, we'll get some Highland Park. Um, yeah. Because then we'll also, because that's another thing we want to talk about as well is like, okay, well, smoking meat versus smoking whiskey and like brining meat and things like the whole other episode. But we'll, we'll, we'll figure out a way to do this. We'll get some, we'll, we'll soak some cloths in Allen Park, wrap up some things and try them side by side. And Petra, yeah, nice. the one that was listening a couple of weeks ago or last week um, down here in DC, he did try, I think actually like in a, just a pack in like a Ziploc bag. He put mm. whiskey that and was was soaking something and was sending me updated pictures he said it tasted great so okay you know, for the infusion side by all means, i mean like yeah people are dry aging professionally Definitely. i mean like you might get a lot more alcohol content in there because if you're wet aging it like that you're not getting the evaporation but yeah, yeah. for sure but i mean like okay. yeah. yeah anyway so uh dry aging we've been doing it for centuries it's a century old technique we've been doing it since we started eating meat essentially it's a great way of well if you take it even further it's pre preserving meat so that's right, like, it's like, ago, like pate negra and you yeah know. your charcuterie side of things but right. you have to add certain nitrates into that to get that to happen ah. um but that's that like cures and things that's a different different pod, mm. uh, episode again um typically used for aging whole sides of beef or big primal cuts because mm. Uh, pardon what's a primal cut so that's like your rump and loins which is your rump with your sirloin your fillet oh, before it's broken down further when it's still in exactly a exactly rump and loin roastings sides of beef four quarters hind quarters ribs of beef those kind of things they're all like your primal cuts um Good. so we tend to age those meats dry aged because the bigger the meat is, the less surface area that you've got of the actual product in the middle to be faced off at the end. Oh, okay. it's almost like sushi, um, like sushi manufacturing, right? You need to, you need to like trim off all the outside edge because it's not going to be sushi grade. The fish might have to, uh, okay, same thing. Exactly, yeah. So that's why yeah. you've got all this waste. Exactly, and that's why that's mm. a lot more waste. That's why dry edge products are a lot more expensive because mm. the customers are, well, we're compensating for the loss of what we've had to do right to the meat beforehand and trim it down I mean, take the take that picture that i posted if anybody saw it on my instagram earlier of that rib of beef in the, i'm holding a bag of water and i weighed the rib when it went in to the aging process and then weighed it again at 60 days and it lost 600 grams of water wow right? so when you're paying well the prices that we pay for beef uh that's quite a lot of money 
in the grand scheme right. of things on a single rib. I mean, that's, that's the same thing for Rose. I mean, you know, if we were making a vodka, if we were just throwing it on you make spirit into the world, it would cost a lot less money than it does for us to both lose the product in the barrel. Yeah. But of course, it's, it's, a, it's a twofold thing, right? We're, we're both losing product. We're making whiskey, we're losing product, and we're yeah. losing um, But we're, we're greatly improving, improving flavor, the profile. flavor, the texture, the everything about it. And it's exactly the same with meat from what I'm hearing. With, exactly. With a double effect, if you're dry aging, of course, all of ours is wet aging, because I don't even know what dry aging would be there. <laughs> but um, it's a double well, effect. I don't know, you could, could vacuum pack a whiskey barrel and see what happens with that that's your job darcy maybe you try that <laughs> <laughs> put the whole barrel into the, wor the, the world's thing. biggest vat pack yeah well wow, that'd be amazing <laughs> um yeah uh so as i was saying it's it's con it's a controlled um process so you're trying to keep within zero degrees and four degrees and a relative humidity of 75 to 80 percent relative humidity um for, oh, so it's actually so it's really pretty humid out there. So that way you're really controlling probably a slow water loss. Exactly. Slow okay. it right down. Yeah. Slow it right down. Get like get that temperature low as well. Obviously, a doesn't spoil the meat, and b slows down the evaporation process as well, as you were saying. Pretty much similar to what you were saying with the whiskey evaporation, right? Out of the barrels. Um. So yeah, so with the dry aging, you get a lot more interaction with. The outside, like I say, outside elements. Obviously, it's inside of refrigeration, but you kind of <laughs> you need <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah kind of around yeah. yeah. Oh, there's so much CO2, carbon monoxide on this one. Lovely, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's got to you, you've got to be using a fridge that you're not opening all the time okay. because, like, the more yeah, you're going to make temperature spikes, you're going to make humidity spikes, things like that. Right. Um, Okay, so, yeah. so in a nutshell, what we've got here then is we've got whiskey aging and beef aging. You can not age your whiskey, but it wouldn't be scotch because it would be new mixed spirit. You can not age your well, beef, you have to, otherwise it sounds like it'll be hard, but you can not age it. Mm. Aging but that's, that's be... going on like, but I say with beef, like you can eat it with after like 20 days, but like dry okay. aging, we're talking about, we're going like, hopefully minimum of 30 days mostly. For most people right. it's like 30 days, but you can okay. take it for a hell of a lot longer. So. Got it. And so obviously that's the same thing for us. Of course, you know, for us it's three years, but of course we can take it an awful lot longer. We've got two things going on, right? We've got, you've got water loss. In Scotland, we've got typically more alcohol loss than water loss, but it's still like volume loss. Yeah. As a result, a concentration of both of those worked flavors that are happening simultaneously. So it really is like a very close, like it's, it's very much about that, that extra journey in the middle because otherwise we'd have... I don't know how to say it. I mean, no one's had bad beef. I guess it's just like chicken and vodka versus like 30 day aged beef and like a good scotch where it's actually, you know, gone through the proper process that's really concerned with right. fine flavor rather than just mass but No offense to vodka. I mean, sorry, man, no offense to chickens. <laughs> that's not, not my intention. But, no, uh, let's um, let's yeah. jump to this question from Liam W. Food. Um, salt chambers. Himalayan salt chambers. You heard of this aging process? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's becoming very popular at the moment. A, if you can get a display with a Himalayan salt chamber for your customers, it looks fucking fantastic. <laughs> it looks really good. Light it from the back. You've got that pink glue, like glow, amber glow. It looks great. Um, we've got a few Himalayan salt blocks chucked in our fridge at work. Um, I'm always fascinated by the amount of water that gets pulled to those salt blocks. Um, mm. Like after a week, the bucket's full of water. I guess the main reason why people are changing to that is it speeds up the, the water loss from the ribs. So it might um, it, uh, speed up the process of the aging of that nutty, meaty, umami flavor that you get from a dry aged beef rib mm. or dry aged beef in general. So I haven't really looked into it that much, but I would like to look into it a lot more. I. I've chucked some in our fridge to see if it helps and I think it has dropped the humidity a little bit in there as well so I think it's great I, I want to take it a little bit further but it costs a fortune to set up a decent rig of that so mm. yeah you know it's funny because yeah. we talked before as well even on the whiskey side there's people playing around with different aging processes right 
I know one thing that one thing that we've done with them um, with Noble Oak, which has been really really successful, both in just the flavour and the pace at which we can produce, is um, you know me saying how really when we're aging, we're talking about those temperature variations, right, and how much is going in and out of the barrel. We'll skip the rest of the things I said about the barrel because that's a huge amount. But we've we've played around on a commercial level, um, and I've seen people play with it on a small level with this idea of how we can put how we can take a liquid and let it go in and out of a barrel in a controlled way by using like, almost like a pressure con like a almost like a pressure chamber, and then right. we can introduce staves into the mix. It's 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 always fascinating just to see the different ways in which people are looking at you know yeah trying new techniques whether it's about using those whiskey soaked cheesecloths and wrapping it for your dry aging whether it's using you know different staves and things to like introduce different flavors into the mix of a more traditional product like I've, I've, I've seen pictures of the chambers and I agree they look great but I've, I've never had I just presumed it made the taste a bit salty but I guess again it's all about getting that liquid out exactly yeah 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 definitely I mean yeah um it's all about flavor when it comes to aging meat I mean like both serve a purpose I mean like not to it's like eating like cheese and wine right, right. um Soft cheese, like I don't can I name companies? Yeah, like Philadelphia, right? That's very I right. presume it's very quick to very quick to make. Uh right. absolute purpose for it. Tastes delicious, quick and go. You're you not gonna write home. Yeah, the creamy cheese. Okay. Philadelphia, not a thing in uh, America. Uh, uh, obviously not the, the place Philadelphia. Like <laughs> quick and easy, lovely, yeah. No. Nice. <laughs> Uh, it probably is. I don't know. Some, yeah. Uh, or Dairy Lee, like, you know, like laughing cow. Yeah. Uh, I've seen Dairy Lee, I think. Just say some like, cam and, like something. Cheese like, in a can. Cheese in okay. a can. <laughs> right. That's delicious, right? But you're not going to go to a Michelin star restaurant and have that. Well, like, these days, remind me. I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, true. Yeah. Whereas, like, and that take, that's very quick to do. Whereas, like, a. Jen loves Philadelphia. The place or the or the cheese? Well, well uh, something like a. <laughs> we're taking something like a Briat Savaran, right? Where it has controlled regulations about how it's going to be aged, how it's going to be made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, quality takes time to make, right? Right. So, yeah, that's it. That that's the biggest difference for me is the flavor between the two different processes of aging meat. Right. Go yeah. On. So. Um, Shall I just do those? I know we've over time, but there's those three other uh, yeah, yeah. types of aging. Uh, the first one, which is you do it at a higher temperature with UV lights that kill the bacteria. Uh, apparently it speeds up the process really quickly. I literally don't know much about it. Uh, does make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely say like, sorry, uh, Karachis. Oh, He's talking about a higher sound. alcohol, taking a higher alcohol with um fattier cuts absolutely yeah definitely take a big merlot big juicy heavy merlot and put it with a really well, fatty and so huh? yeah it's, i mean yeah sammy same thing like with and lyle and i talked about this in terms of like when you're pairing your whiskeys with it and your scotches with it yeah take a higher proof for and we're, we're gonna we'll do a whole thing on this right between mm. between mouthfeel and the type of cut that it is right that that, that mm. fillet and how it feels in the mouth I might not want something that's going to be too pungent and punchy, so I might want something more like the Glen Rothes that's pretty light and pretty lean and very like delicate on the on the palate, so that, yeah. so that it's kind of non-combative against that. But yeah, that bigger like you know when you've like peppered all over something like a um, I don't know, you're the meat person. Give me something that's much more robust and like heavier what? to get into. Like a what? Like a steak wise, like yeah. a nice juicy ribeye but without interrupting okay. the fat. Right. So, so something yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, at that point when you've got that muscular fat, I probably would because it's gonna it's gonna have a bit bigger like yeah. older feeling to it. I probably it would stick, go it with sticks to your mouth a lot more, like right. Fat and that, will stick to your mouth. Right, and that's that's probably where I would go with that higher proof, like a higher proof Highland Park. That's yeah, all, wash all that out and just yeah. to it, wash it out. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We, as soon as this is over, we'll just get together and do a pile of different trials together. <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll do a full Sammy. We'll do a full thing where we will maybe separately try and. <laughs> cook steak i'll get some whiskey shipped to you and we'll just try it because again like we need to do this without any prep with no preparation variation as well right, yeah sorry. right uh yeah sorry we spoke about the whiskey aged beef so uv aging with heat yikes yeah yeah it sounds very like futuristic uh whiskey aging that we done already right. um and then also people have started doing tallow beef aged uh meat as well so that's Essentially, like we spoke earlier and you said, oh, is it like confiting? I'm like, 
Yes, in a way, like you obviously you heat up fat and then pour it over the primal cup, mostly done with like ribs of beef, um, and it just encases it. So it's a preservation kind of thing. You're gonna the point of it is flip side is you lose that intense flavor because there's no um, evaporation of liquid because it's an encased thing, but you have less product waste. It's kind of like a fancy wet aging essentially. So, so the so the flavor. It's less dilute because yeah. no, sorry, it's it's less concentrated because you've diluted it less by loss of water. Yeah, meat angel share. I'm gonna make this a thing. Yeah, you know, meat, so we've not had the meat angel, <laughs> so it's still yeah. less intense in flavor, but it's packed and cased everything in at the same time. Exactly. So you're not having that trimming off the edges of that crusty salty moldy outside which sounds disgusting but it's delicious right so then actually what's the benefit of that because if you're not like i know you're not cutting it off so you're not losing it but you're not gaining that flavor as well no because it looks fucking cool like, <laughs> <laughs> if i post that on my instagram of like a a tallow aged beef where people can be like wow this guy like yeah it's okay, something so new post, it's post, marketing post. Toy. Post one after this. Actually, you know, can you post one? I'll give you the. Send me the picture. I'll post it to Butcher and Barrel. Today's the day. We'll put some pictures up there and we'll okay, send yeah. it to a Butcher and Barrel. We'll make yeah. a post about it and we'll start putting some of our things in there. Um, but we we said that we were going to do thirty minutes. We've gone up to forty two, which I think is much better than like an hour and a half last oh. time. <laughs> we'll get there one day. Um, exactly. I think what we need to do is we need to get Sammy involved one time because Sammy I know is importing these days and probably has some wonderful, wonderful. Uh, interesting things he's bringing in so if you okay. want to bring things into the states and then we can bottle them and send them right the way back to europe <laughs> yeah no nice. um, we'll, we'll be excited to play around with all kinds of things but uh i guess in a nutshell Definitely. why do we age scotch why do we age beef or age animals in general because it tastes great mm. definitely definitely right. yeah Did it's all in the flavor it? There's some angel share on both sides. For you, it's more important for flavor. For me, it's kind of like, well, I wish I didn't lose it, but that's fine. I guess I do. Um, yeah. But it's it's all it's flavors king, right? Absolutely, yeah. And that's what, yeah. That's yeah. why we do what we do. We try and find the best flavors that we do right. that we can. And again, and to and and to take that further as well, remembering that flavor isn't just obviously you know what we you know taste like that taste. Sense of, sense yeah, there's of, sort of like how yeah. it smells, the feeling on the palate, the, just the, the everything about yeah. it. Exactly. And like, well, isn't there the thing that you, you taste 70% of it with your eyes before you even, even put it in your mouth? Right. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Great. Um, I did have one question that came up from what you yes. are. I know, I know we're trying to finish it, but sure. when you make barrels, are you using new wood or are you using um, kiln dried wood? Right. If you see what I mean? Is it like green wood? Sorry. So I'm gonna, I'll talk about we and I'll do this very quickly. I'll talk about they and I'll talk about we. They, yeah. Highland, uh, they, everybody else. We Highland Park for now. We Highland Park use a number of different barrel sources. We sometimes use ex bourbon casks, which is mm -hmm. a secondary product. We're getting it from a bourbon house. It's already been used. It looks like this. It was still charred on the inside, and that one's uh, you know we we have specifications for it, but we get what we get. Right, we do everything we can to get the best we can, but we get what we get. So we use secondary products. We also use this, which is still a secondary product. This is a European oak sherry cask. But mm -hmm. this one has been um, pretty much custom made for us from start to finish in the sense that we chose the tree where it was in northern Spain. Wow, North nice. America. The tree was felled sustainably. It was air dried in the forest for like a year and a half to two years. Shipped right, so you do dry it out. Yeah. We do dry it out, get rid of some of the tannins, some of the green compounds that you mentioned because we don't want that green flavor. Uh, it goes down to cooperages in the south of Spain, Jerez. Uh, they're raised into casks to our specifications, filled with shit. Like it's this whole thing that no one else does, where it is a secondary product in the sense that we've seasoned it with sherry, but it's a primary product because we made it from scratch for the sole purpose of making these barrels the best possible ones they can be for aging. Because as we talked about before, like it is the it is the biggest thing, right? Yes, the, the aging is the biggest thing. That's that's where the secret sauce is. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, nice. All of the conversation again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Okay. All right. Well, that's a good place to end, I think. I think. Yeah. And sorry for you guys who just joined, but uh, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll we'll repost this um, at uh, butcher and barrel. There's nothing there at the moment. Go go over there. Head over there in a day or two. You'll see this posted over there. Yeah. And um, we'll get some content posted up on there of what we've spoken about already. Yeah. Love it. Nice one, dude. Okay. You I'll too, man. Me.
Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.